right, so uh, continuing in the Counter-Reformation, so we saw the Council of Trent, the formation of various reform orders, and the order, the, the older orders, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Benedictines, uh, the various monastic orders, Cistercians, the, the Norbertine canons, right, they all look to now, they have to correspond with Trent, they all look to reforming their orders, reforming their ways of life to bring them into accord with the various canons of Trent with the spirit of the reform that's in the air. There's a lot of reformers that appear in those orders getting kind of their acts together to bring down cases of uh, abuse and, and bad things happening through the orders. And one thing to keep in mind, one of the big sticking points you see in the theological discussions of the time is the right of mendicant orders like the Dominicans and Franciscans to preach almost universally. And this is another thing that you want kind of fixed to Trent that gives the bishops more authority. And it's one of those interesting things there's the usual argument, yeah, Trent centralizes everything and locks it all in with the Pope. It's actually not true. Trent actually gives a lot of decentralization because it's giving the bishops more authority to enforce their own their standards, especially with mendicant preachers, with Dominicans and Franciscans and, and others that kind of have the free reign to do whatever. Now they don't. Even though they still have their basic general privilege to preach, the bishop still needs to confirm it. They can't just go wherever they want, doing whatever they want. Now that they have, have to be under the church. So at the time of the founding of the Jesuits, the um, you know they intended to be missionaries, and then they end up becoming kind of missionaries in Europe, right? So Europe will be the India for them. So uh, all the Saint Francis Xavier goes off to Portugal from when from where he goes to India and becomes the great apostle of the Indies. And I have another talk on him that um, I haven't given anywhere yet, but uh, perhaps perhaps another time. So the journey, the journey to the end of the earth, uh, the, the story of St. Francis Xavier. It's a great history of that, that particular saint. We just don't have time to go into it today. Um, but that, his example inspires the rest of Europe with missionary activity. And so the Jesuits become largely locked in with education, training the youth, doing catechism, and also with uh, reconverting Protestants, and this becomes one of the big missions, kind of accidentally, it was never anything they set out to do, but they end up becoming that. So it starts with St. Peter Canisius now, um, or uh, Peter Canis, as he was. He was from the Protestant city of Nimbagen, or what becomes the Protestant city. First is Catholic city, or it's one of the biggest cities in Holland. And one of the, the things we have not talked about much is the, the Reformation in Holland, and that's another one that um, again, another two-hour rabbit hole, so I had to kind of diminish it, sadly. But, uh, so Peter Connies was from Nimwegen, and when the Calvinists start taking over in Holland, all the Catholic inhabitants of the city are expelled. And so his family makes it to Germany, to Cologne. And in Cologne, Peter Canisius sets up as a canon and a lawyer, and so he starts uh, going through all that, that course, and he, he wants to become a canon of the cathedral fully, and he's in training for that. His dad, on the other hand, wants to kind of have him pull out and get married. And as he's going through his, his spiritual formation, Canisius decides what the Latin form of his name Canisius. He decides that he rather be a Cartesian. He sees the Cartesian monks with this super austere way of life. And so they're so austere, you live in your cells, come together for community celebration of the divine office and for a solemn mass once a week, conventional mass, and the rite of St. Bruno. Otherwise, you're working in yourselves, prayer and work and death. And so this is extremely attractive to Canisius. He says, maybe this is really weird. I want to get, uh, I want to spend the rest of my life. And then uh, one of the missionaries from St. Ignatius comes rolling through Germany, Peter Faber. And he begins preaching in all the cities that he goes to about uh, the reform of the church that's being affected, the truth of the church, and he has such passion and such, um, such joy even as he's preaching. And that's one of the things too. So some people say, well, don't be more and more conservative, more traditional. I get to be more, more dour. You can't be happy. You can't laugh at Jews. Well, you know, holy people don't do that. Holy things need to be kind of this dour, plaster face saint, right? Your smile cracks their face. But the reality is the saints are among the most joyful people that, uh, that ever were. And, uh, and also mixed with the secular people, St. Uh, Francis Xavier, for example, would play cards with the Japanese and get to get into, into their, um, even though, as he was trying to learn their language and, and couldn't even still get into the kind of their basic social action interactions and rejoiced with them, right, also. 
and he was a human rather than being like some you know plaster angel or something. So the same thing with Saint Peter Canisius, and he sees this in, in, in Faber, and he says, "Wow, I want to go where that man's going," and that's it. So Faber constitutes him in, in the, the first Jesuits that he's, he's setting up in Germany. He joins, he becomes part of the order. The Jesuit constitutions would only be approved by Pope Paul III in 1540. And they would uh, be the subject of controversy in some of their ways, and eventually all the all the uh, arguments against them would be removed. And so the Jesuits' simple vows that they take would be understood as solemn vows once they were made. They would have the same forms. And so the Jesuits would be properly constituted as religious that way, canonically speaking. And so Canisius is becomes part of this first group of Jesuits, and he starts putting his energies into um, especially improving his Latin learning more of the, the, the scholarly histories and humanism, the, the language that was important in the day, resisting the Protestants. Now the Protestants were coming into Cologne from other areas of Germany and were writing up various propaganda tracts like we saw last night. And in these propaganda tracts, people with you know, less education, even some clergy would be really tempted to kind of sway one way or the other. The Archbishop of Cologne was a Prince Archbishop whose basic uh, pastimes were hunting and feasting, and not really theology. In fact, he knew very little about it. He also cared very little about it. It was mostly a question of hunting. So the Lutherans came to him, and he was really seriously thinking about uh, swaying to the Lutheran side. And that would mean not only did you have Philip II of Hess, you know, the land of the Mugrav of Hess, not only would you have the elector of Saxony who was Lutheran, but you would now have a third elector. If, if the Bishop of Cologne went over to the Lutherans, and that might mean the next Ro Holy Roman Emperor might be a Lutheran, right? Which would take the entire entirety of the empire into Lutheranism. And that could be extremely devastating to the church. So Canisius worked tirelessly with counter pamphlets, they're right? encountering all the Lutheran propaganda. And he himself met with the sorry, he himself met with the Archbishop of Cologne on several occasions to bring him, you know, to, to try to convince him to make him hold the course. And so while he's working with all the clergy, they steadfastly resist the Archbishop and stay true to the Catholic faith. And because of that, he's not able to, to jump ship and, and go Lutheran. And then on top of that, Charles V, as we saw, smashes the Svalkaldic League, which ends the, the effective Lutheran military resistance. And so, and then he's turning back toward Cologne, and he says, uh, nope, that wasn't a good idea. I'm glad I didn't do that. So he stays Catholic, albeit uh, extremely disinterested. That becomes the first uh, major victory for, for Canisius in his very long life of defending the Catholic faith. So from there, he uh, ends up going to Rome, where he meets Ignatius and actually learns from him, and is taught by Ignatius. So Ignatius will die in 1556, by the way. But uh, in the meantime, he teaches Canisius through you know, directly, he gives him the spiritual exercises directly again, and then tra uh, trains him in his mode of thought. And Canisius then takes that wherever he goes. He sets up some schools in southern Italy. He preaches to the Council of Trent during its early sessions. And he's very active everywhere in Catholic life. And then finally, he's, he's active in Germany during all those inter years between Trent, when Trent's not sitting. He's back in Germany arguing again for the Catholic faith and necessity of the Council, getting princes on board with uh, you know, carrying out the Council. He's also very much responsible for working with Ferdinand I of the Empire to keep the earlier work of Trent as part of the council. Here he is addressing the council itself, actually, in his painting. So the, uh, the angels present, which uh, there was a version inspiring. So then he sets up in uh, Germany. Ultimately, he ends up in Switzerland in the city of Freiburg, which is over here. When he gets there, that's where he'll stay, basically, for the rest of his life. He wrote a number of treatises uh, defending the Catholic faith, he wrote a wonderful treatise on the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's extremely lengthy, and in Latin, there's a reason why nobody's ever translated it. It's extremely long. It's very, very good. Um, it, but it's it's a major, it'd be a major chunk of my years to get that entire book done um, correctly. But anyway, so he takes all what the Protestants had said of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that's one place that I didn't really cover last night. What was Luther's view of Mary? How about Calvin? How about the other reformers? And so it is curious that they, they don't exactly say what a modern evangelical would say. Luther's view of the Blessed Virgin Mary is that she's sinless and that, you know, it's like a sort of immaculate conception. Not the same as if she was conceived, uh, if she was purified in the womb, 
not the same as she was conceived immaculately in the Catholic teaching, but essentially that Christ, through a special action, um, had cleansed her from her from her sins. Right, so she's almost at the same point of the Immaculate Conception, and some of that's the Franciscan influence on Luther. It comes from Occam and Occamism. So he he argues that uh, when certain Protestants de deny Mary's perpetual virginity, Luther comes in to defend it, both from the standpoint of what the Greek actually says. And also the early church fathers like Jerome and others that had defended it. And Luther takes the very same point that um, we have to, because she's the new tabernacle. And he shows Mary in devotion and prays for Mary. But at the same time, his theology of the saints holds that the Blessed Virgin and all the saints have no more merit than we do as believers in faith. As someone who's been justified by faith, the merits of Christ are imputed to us. So therefore, for Luther... We're all the same, and that's why praying to the Blessed Virgin doesn't really do anything for you than because she's then like asking your friend over here to pray because she has no more merit than I do, right? Which is one of those curious things. Why well, still hold to any Marian devotion at that point? So he, but he does. Calvin, on the other hand, is clear. It, it doesn't really regard it. The only place where he addresses it at all is in, in Luke um, and his commentary on the Scriptures. Calvin wrote a very copious commentary on the Scripture, uh, which you can still get today. It's, Exorbitantly expensive, so you have to get it online. Uh, it, it's a, but he makes a lot of interesting observations on Mary. He's not, he definitely isn't where Luther is. He doesn't uphold, I mean, he would have held praying to Mary as superstitious, but at the same time, uh, uh, you know, it holds her up as the Holy Mother of Christ. He's just not, you know, doesn't think she's due any reverence or anything. Even though right there in Luke it says, All generations will call me blessed. Calvin would say that's blasphemy, because, you know, because well, we can't, the dead can't do anything for us. Calvin also believes that the saints don't actually go to heaven. The saints are actually in the bosom of Abraham that you see reference, that Christ references, waiting for the final resurrection of the dead. So for Calvin, you can't even pray to the saints. The dead can't hear you because that's where they are. They're kind of like suspended in the bosom of Abraham until the end. And that was the era of Pope John XXII who tried to teach that So in, in the Middle Ages. Whereas um, even Luther still held the saints went to heaven. Now, modern Calvinists tend to abandon that point. Modern Calvinists tend to believe that um, the saints are actually in heaven. Just like in other areas, like, for example, Calvin's invisible church, that we don't know who's really a member of the church because the elect are saved by faith. That's all on the inside. And so we don't know who is and isn't part of the elect, right? So therefore, the church is invisible for Calvin. A lot of modern Presbyterians say, no, no, we do need visible signs by which we know. Because they adhere more to the Westminster Confession. So anyway, uh, so Canisius writes a number of things refuting like that, for example, that ecclesiology of the invisible church. He has a number of sermons, but he's noted everywhere for his charity. And even the Protestants had to say that we could always go to him. And, and anytime we needed anything and anytime we want to discuss because he's so full of charity and love, he never gave us a sore word. He never treated us wrongly. Right? And a lot of Protestants converted just because of his demeanor working with them was so impressive. So in 1591, he gets a stroke and, and it ends his, his productive powers and ends up kind of persisting until 1597, where it went eventually he dies. And he was held at being one of the great theologians of the age. It's extremely important. Um, he's also counted as one of the first Jesuits, even though he was not one of the first companions of Ignatius. Just as important in Rome itself is St. Philippe Neri, St. Philip Neri. And Neri was a Florentine. And while he was living in Rome, he had a certain vision where he saw the Holy Ghost and he saw this, basically this ball of light come down into him and he felt his heart expand. So it, it, I guess a comparison, uh, somewhat absurd comparison, the modern uh, movie about the Grinch stole Christmas, right? <laughs> Everyone remembers at the end of the Grinch's heart bruise, right? Well, that's literally what happened to St. Philip Mary. It's the point where he actually broke a couple of his rib cage and in the body, you can see his ribs were really broken with a heart was so expanded, and he was, in a consequence of this, he was always really, really warm. And so he was, the Pope actually allowed him to unbutton his cassock when he was in the, in the papal presence because he was so hot that he just couldn't take it, especially in the Roman sun. Neri was full of joy and love to everyone he met. So as a, as a priest, he uh, would, would say Mass you know, da daily, and when, at the time when a lot of priests did not say Mass daily. And when I mean, he did so, he'd give alms to the poor, and so he kind of had a general life in Rome, and then with some companions, he started he, the plans to form the oratories. So what they had done is they went to um, Tre Fontane, which is outside of Rome, and it's the, the reputed martyrdom of St. Paul, where St. Paul was um, ex 
executed by the Romans. Since he was a Roman citizen, he was beheaded, not crucified. And the legend is that the head, as it rolled, it had three, in three places where it had rolled, springs had formed up. And they were flowing until sometime in the mid 20th century. So the, um, but they, they'd been constantly flowing there. So they had big basilica built over it. And you could see where the springs used to flow and everything. And so over in that area, there was a Benedictine hermit. And so Philip Neri and, and uh, others, they went to him and asked, what should we do? Because they wanted to see if they should try missionary activity. The example of Francis, uh, Francis Xavier inspired them. Maybe we should go up to the missions. And so the, the monk says, you know, Rome shall be your mission. And they, and they take from that the, the need to work and perform the youth, because you've got a lot of young youth in Rome, some of whom are bastards from nobility and, and various mistresses. So that, and I use that word in its legal sense, by the way. Um, some of them are, you know, you know, kids who are just not being educated in the faith because we're still looking toward the future reform that hasn't been completely effective in the city yet. And you have clergy that are unsupporting of preaching retreats. So Philip Neri works with a lot of youth. That's why he's actually a patron of youth and youth ministry and such things. He works with um, people of nobody to really teach them catechism. He's a confessor. He hears people's confessions, and when you actually read about the confessions he would give, he's somewhat of a sadist, <laughs> because he gives them weird penances that are meant to, but he also had the gift of reading souls, so you can see when you needed certain things to happen. So this one guy had problems with human respect. He was always worried about what people would think of him. So Philip Neri gave him as a penance that he had to dress up like a harlequin and go deliver a letter to Cardinal Baronius, because he knew, and they knew the guy would know that Baronius was in a church saying vespers, with important cardinals, important people that, that uh, he would want the respect from, and he has to go dressed in this fashion. So then he decided that he would carry out the penance, but he'd sneak through the narthex of the church and try to deliver it to Baronius where nobody would see him. And Philip caught him trying to sneak away, and he said, now get over there through the main aisle. Go now. And he gave a lot of penances like this. Another time a woman had come and confessed to him that, he, that she had gossiped about her neighbor, and she was sorry for that. She realizes that it was wrong and she shouldn't have done it. So Philip says, all right, now, here's your penance, but you're gonna have to come back for more instructions. I want you to go buy a chicken, pluck it, keep all the feathers. Okay? So she goes out, she buys a chicken, she plucks the chicken, and you bring it in, she comes back with the feathers. Very good. Now, he says, I want you to take those feathers out, and I want you to scatter them to the winds. Okay, so she goes and scatters them to the winds. And then the next uh, thing is she comes back and says, now, and he says, very good, now I will give you absolution after you've gone and collected them all. And she says, well, I can't do that. That's impossible. They, I mean, they, they've scattered so far and wide. How do I even find where any of it, where they could all have gone? And he says, exactly, just as your words have been scattered to the winds of people's ears, and you cannot find whose ears they have all gone to to correct your former gossiping. And then, uh, so after she, she sees it, you know, her fault, then gives her absolution and, and never she never gossiped again. Right? And, and it's interesting, you know, these little examples of, you know, it seems to us a crazy thing. Probably a priest today or something like that would probably end up in a psychological counseling with the bishop or something. <laughs> but um, the, we, he, because he could read souls, he knew what to do to get people to really understand the effects of their sins. Like gossip's one of those ones that unfortunately, Lots of people, and women get the bad rap for this, but men are just as bad. You just look at Facebook anyway. Um, the, the gossiping is such a bad sin, and people have no problem kind of spreading out all this stuff about other people, and they never stop to think, wait a minute, that really is a bad sin. I just let out all this, this uh, information about something that's not true, or maybe it is true and nobody needs to know it. And how do I correct that, or, or, or you know, with all the people that I could possibly go to, there's no way to go. And so that's one of the reasons why it's such a bad sin, so almost irreparable. But Neri's work not only brought him into contact with Rome's youth, but also with many of the clergy, even popes. When Pope St. Pius V became pope, he was very concerned, actually because he was a saint, he was very concerned about Philip Neri's ministry. Philip Neri, um, he, was, he, he thought that some of the legends of the saints were being improperly given, lay people were giving exhortations to church, he was very nervous about what this might foretell. So he sent some people to investigate it, 
and then uh, and fine, everything is exactly the way it should be. And then uh, Neri's brought before Pius V, where he gives a special con uh, commendation. And, uh, and a lot of people in the curious see this, and they decide to take him as a confessor, also because they see the direction that St. Pius V is giving, that he wants holiness. And so the curious say, okay, well, we better get, better get before we're gotten rid of. So they find Philodere, who directs their souls and directs them more toward holiness, away from the vices of being too concerned about the world. And so one of the uh, people that here is confessor is the future Pope Clement VIII, right, that Neri directed for a good number of years. So without Philip Neri, Rome would have been a far poorer place and the reform of the Roman Curia would have been almost unimaginable. So, and the next thing we can also mention about Philip Neri is that if you've ever seen, uh, if you've ever gone to a traditional Latin mass and you've seen the priest, in this country it tends to be the priest where what's called the Roman chasuble or it's also described as the fiddleback chasuble, um, and it's a you know, square vestment that, that sits in the priest as opposed to the Gothic chasuble. Now the Gothic is actually older. A lot of people think that square one is actually the older one. It's not true. That only Philip Neri is the one who actually designed it as a modification of the much longer conical vestments. And so he designed, designs that as a simplification that would be easier for the priest to wear in St. Mass. Especially without uh, ceremony, if he's doing low mass and whatnot, it'd be easier to walk around it. And so that's where that comes from. And for whatever reason, it was that during the 60s and the change into the ordinary form, where that was the vestment they decided they didn't like anymore. They wanted to move to Gothic vestments. And it's true, the Gothic vestment was older, although the ones they produced were not very good. <laughs> uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand um, one time had a uh, student that was one of my professors in college, and he had gone to Mass, and the priest was wearing a vestment that had Snoopy on. <laughs> so he called up von Hildebrand and said, uh, you, know, you know, telling him about the story, and von Hildebrand just responded, well, what you should have done is ask the priest, did you make that yourself or did you have help? <laughs> <laughs> that's how, that's how the, um, some of the craziness went. So that, that Baroque chasuble, that, that uh, Roman uh, vestment, was kind of considered cliche, get rid of that. And that's why uh, traditional Catholics often associate that as the traditional vestment, because it was so singularly isolated out, isolated out as being one to get rid of. And so, the, and that's one of the reasons you see that. One of uh, Neri's disciples in the oratory was Card Caesar Cardinal Baronius. Baronius was uh, a young man, and as soon as he uh, joined the oratory, his family disowned him, and he knew this was exactly what God wanted him to do. So he never really had any money, so Philip took care of all of his needs and everything. And while he was mostly interested in theology, philosophy, canon law, and, and um, other pursuits, Philip said, why don't you get into history? And Baronius, you know, he's like, well, what am I going to do in history? I don't know anything about it. So Philip said, well, why don't, just, just go ahead, start writing a book on, on church history. So he starts investigating, learning the sources, learning the principles. And um, following through, he starts writing a book, and then other people hear he's writing a book, and various historians and folks that give him money to write a church history. And the big problem was there was a Protestant history book that had come out right about this time, and it's called The Centuries of Magdeburg. Well, he, most Protestants have never heard that. And one of the reasons is it's a really lousy book. And you know, in the 18th century, Protestants were embarrassed to have anything to do with it because it was such a shoddy work of scholarship. It was done by uh, one of the most energetic of Luther's former disciples, um, Matthew Flywitz, who becomes, uh, he takes on a pen name, Illyricus, because he's from the same region of Illyria that St. Jerome was from, so he calls himself Illyricus. And so he writes, uh, with a bunch of other writers and scribes and, and theologians, Lutheran theologians, the centuries of Magdeburg, which was meant to show that the early church was Lutheran and not Catholic. And so he gets rid of it, elements of uh, history that he doesn't want to deal with. He instead incorporates anything that can be used to show that the Pope was Antichrist, no matter what it is. And then anything that could possibly show Lutheranism. So St. Robert Bellarmine notes in his reputation of certain sections of the writings that what they call uh, blemishes in the Church Fathers, namely Catholic doctrines, they call heresies when we teach them, right? And so all this stuff, oh yeah, well, well there's this blemish in Tertullian. He teaches uh, uh, confirmation. Even though uh, they, they say that it's an error of the confirmation, but it's okay in the Father, it's just, just a blemish. So they're trying to cover over that all of these Catholic doctrines were taught at the very beginning. 
So this came out, but the one problem was at the time this was written, Gellerman hadn't come around to write yet, and this was seen as the, the new cutting edge history. And the church had neglected church history for a very long time. And so when you sit down and do history, you have a textbook, and this has been co co copiously written, and you know people with uh, lots of alphabet soup next to their name have come up with these these books and gone through you know various works and established history. They produce this thing for you. Now that is usually drawn together from the secondary sources. Now these are the books by academics, by more professional academics, and the way they produce these books, if they're good academics, is they go to manuscripts, they go to libraries where they keep these manuscripts, they know a couple of languages, at least one or two, they know, uh, you know how to read handwriting in these periods, and so you sit down with the manuscript in various periods, you get the primary source history, you get the, the accounts of things, and then if you have to, and so you do, because you can't master every language, you have to rely on the work of other historians that, that have been translated, that have looked at these particular manuscripts, and so you have to rely on something that's in print. So between all of this mess of primary source materials, archaeology, and other established facts, the historian then has to compose this into a narrative. All historical narratives are artificial, including mine. The narratives did not unfold. Some of these things I'm covering chronologically, some I'm covering topically. Nothing unfolds in exactly the way a historian narrates it. But yet, a historian gives, gives you, is supposed to give you a good picture of essentially what happened in terms of facts. And, so there, and there is historical facts, and from historical facts come historical opinion. And you can't, um, and you can't treat one of them as both one and the same thing. And it, the history will change. So today you hear a lot about revisionist history, and it, which gets demonized. If you want to demonize somebody who's making a historical case, you say, well, that's just revisionist history. Oh, I'm sorry, all history is being revised all the time. If you were in the early 19th century, and you were talking about the late Roman Empire, you would call the Hadrian's Wall what is called the Severan Wall, because it was universally held. The Septimius Severus built it in 190 AD. But then, uh, the, the Roman, you know, the, some people came around saying the Roman Emperor Hadrian built it. Like, oh, psh. And so they were actually called Hadrianists, and they were mocked by the establishment. Until some period, some documentation, and some archaeological finds up in Scotland showed that it was actually Hadrian, and done at the time of Hadrian, and the majority of opinion was wrong. That's what happens, because history is a social science, and you're always revising, you're always correcting, you're always learning more things. And there's some things I've propounded that may be found to be wrong in the light of further scholarship. Right? And that will happen to all historians. That's just a matter of fact. Unfortunately, also to poor Baronius, but not so much. So his work is a pioneering success because he goes into the sources. So he's looking at these centuries of modern day birth. They're propounding all the stuff from the church fathers, all the stuff from ancient times to make the early church of Lutheran. And now he's been tasked with producing a counter history. But that's authentic, not merely this is now our version. We need the documents. So he learns how to read things in manuscript. Which when he starts it, he's getting old documents. He doesn't even know how to read. And he has to go through a massive amount of training, but he does it. And he produces what's called the Annales, the Annals. And there are about 17 volumes or so, if I'm not mistaken. They run through the 13th century before he petered out and wasn't able to write anymore. And they're basically the pioneering effort that creates modern historical scholarship. Because previous to that, you would have a historian, you'd have chroniclers, they would write an account of something, they would write what they saw, and you didn't have history books done in the way Baronius does it. So his ecclesiastical history becomes the model for how all modern secular historians do history, because he's going to primary sources, because he's showing what's in documents, because he's relating them, and he also has to craft a narrative to explain them. And that's what makes the work so good, and it immediately supplants what the centuriators of Magda Burke had been doing. Because everyone in Protestants realize, wow, this is some serious stuff. And then when they go to fact check, they find out everything Baronius is saying is correct. So Isaac Casaubon, for example, is a Calvinist theologian around the same time in France. And he's also a very, very sharp character, very intelligent. And when he uh, was trying to refute Baronius on several points, is he kept going through the history, kept finding Baronius was correct. And you know, everything he fact checked, fact checked in Baronius was right. So he gets the, you know, the fame for that. He was also a very holy cardinal. He did not want to be made a cardinal. He was happy as an oratorian father working in St. Philip Mary's oratory. He wanted nothing more than that. And then Clement VIII became pope, and Clement VIII first chose him to be his confessor, since St. Philip Mary couldn't do it anymore. And uh, he says, oh, all right, you know, I'll be your confessor. 
And then finally, Clement VIII makes him a cardinal, and he tells him he must accept it under pain of excommunication, mostly because Clement VIII realized the vast majority of the cardinals were worthless, and I actually need somebody who's useful to have around as a cardinal. It's the same thing that will happen, of course, in Bummer Bellarmine. So Baronius and Bronaronius and Bellarmine become good friends. I mean, Bellarmine has the same thing foisted on him because he only wanted to be a simple Jesuit. He never wanted to be a cardinal. So he goes and to Baronius to find out how to set up his household so that way he can save his soul and be damned for some kind of uh, excess in the cardinal. St. Charles Borromeo, another holy uh, saintly cardinal, one of the few and proud amongst cardinals for, for being saintly. He is uh, part of traditional Roman nobility, and he is uh, made a lay cardinal at a young age and given various you know, ecclesiastical benefices and jobs. And he's expected to be, you know, more or less keep the money in the family. He's gonna run this, you know, this place now, and this one, accumulate various amounts of wealth. And what the family expects from him is that he will eventually resign the cardinalate and get married, keep the money going in the aristocratic family, as, as it were, use the church as the cash cow that keeps us going. Well, Borromeo starts reading the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. He starts doing them, and his spiritual life really starts to pick up. So one of the things he does is start using a lot of money to feed the homeless in Rome from his own table, which again, amongst cardinals at the time he's doing this, 1550s, is a pretty rare thing. And then he's, uh, you know, Pope Pius IV becomes Pope. And they, they, his family you know, have an inroad with the Pope, and they're really pushing, you know, resign him from the cardinal, because. Borromeo is an extremely efficient administrator. And he's also very good at handling money. He's very good at keeping the account books and making sure he knows where everything's going and how to best organize and manage people. So Borromeo then uh, you know, sees what's coming and he knows his family is going to get it up. And the Pope doesn't want to let him go because he's indispensable to the Pope in managing the treasure. So Borromeo then goes, finds a bishop to ordain him, and then he's ordained. So now there's no going back, and the family, his family had to give up. So now and then the Pope had him consecrated a bishop and the Bishop of Milan. Now this was a sore spot for Borromeo because he was committed to Trent's decrees on Episcopal residence and the Pope would not allow him to actually reside in Milan. And Milan was a huge mess because no bishop had resided there in a hundred years. So, uh, so what he does, he sets up, he continues to work in the papal administration, but he actually sets, uh, uh, sends a couple of um, very holy priests and Jesuits there to try to kind of prepare the ground for him. We'll talk about what happens in Milan in a minute. He's eventually able to prevail on St. Pius V to let him go there. But in the meantime, he works very hard on getting the last uh, uh, period of the Council of Trent running into a close. And he's very much a force at the Council of Trent, along with St. Peter, Canisius, and others, to keep the Council Fathers together from fracturing in one of her of the dozen points over which the Council nearly broke for so many times. Um, Cardinal Moroni, who was the papal legate, a couple of times he just threw up his hands and said, it's all worthless, it's never, we're never going to get this council off the ground. It's a miracle if we, if we could ever get anything done here. Right? And it's because of people like Borromeo that they persevered and continue. But his real glory is in Milan. Now Milan is a city in the north of Italy, it goes back to Roman times, and St. Ambrose was the bishop of that seat, very famous, um, Cathedral was built there in the Middle Ages, still there, it's still massive and beautiful. Milan had its own liturgical rite, and what had happened was the traditional dynasty that ran Milan starting in the high Middle Ages was the Sforza, and the Sforza had uh, you know, control of it up until the Spanish came and exiled the, uh, the Sforza. Charles V um, used an old hereditary grant to the Holy Roman Emperor to exile the Sforza. And then he gave Milan as a formal territory to his son, Philip, when he organized, he sent his son, Philip, to England's very Mary Tudor. So the, uh, that way he could do so as a king, because he was king of Milan. So the Spanish run things in Milan and have for at least a, you know, a decade or so at this point. And the, uh, the situation of the church is really, really bad. So we mentioned Episcopal absenteeism. So there's an administrator who's again siphoning off the cash. So the priests at the bottom, they're vagrant priests, some of them join gangs, so they carry guns openly and start shooting at each other at different times, and they're whoever, however you can get the most money and the most uh, whatever of bad things. You'll find the priest in the tavern drinking it down, you'll find him gambling, you'll find him the worst dens of sin and carrying out the worst sins that you can think of because that's kind of the culture that's been created and so much so the saying in Milan was 
si vuole, si vuole andare al fermo, essere il fermo, you want to go to hell, be a priest. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, the, that was the saying, that was the expectation, because that's what would happen. So the first thing Borromeo does, he prepares the ground. Um, Oriander was one of his, um, one of his friends came as an administrator of the diocese, who tried to put things in order. He had so much resistance there that eventually he gave up, he left, and he couldn't deal with it anymore. So the Jesuits come in the city to preach several retreats to try to prepare the ground. And finally, in the, uh, in the 1570s, Borromeo makes his formal entry into Milan uh, with a formal procession, and then he leads a period of fasting to make reparation for all the things that have taken place in the diocese. And he publicly leads. And then, so first he works out trying to reestablish religious houses, uh, again, for the reformation of, of former prostitutes. He's working on establishing the Jesuits firmly in the city. The biggest thing is a seminary. The next thing is cashiering all these worthless priests that are not going to reform. And so the, uh, as we forbid, of course, priests from carrying weapons, which was already forbidden, but it had to, he had to do a special law to make sure, because he's got the big problems. You have the old Sforza dynasty that are allied with the Sforza, the local Italian kind of uh, aristocrats, and then you have the Spaniards who run the place technically, and they like the disorder because it kind of keeps everyone busy while they're in, firmly in power and firmly enhanced the cash coming out of the city. So uh, Borromeo has to fight the Spanish as well as the traditional Sforza aristocracy and the old guard in the church that doesn't want to reform. So the first thing is the seminary. We're going to train new priests and he creates really the model of a model seminary. And doing this, then everyone in their diocese can look now to how this seminary is set up and, hey, we're going to do that over here. And he has a lot of Jesuits to run it. Uh, Father Adorno is a major figure of the Jesuits at the time. He, he runs their humanities program. And the Jesuits start forming their system of education. They've been doing it for a while. We mentioned earlier the, the medieval system, the trivium, and then the quadrivium. And so this is taken and beefed up with a lot of humanistic studies. But the Jesuits add a few extra things that are really interesting. So they're taking one. They plan on taking the student all the way to the collegiate level, whereas the traditional system of education is just looking at like the basic position and you hand them off to someone else, right? And then the university takes it, you start with philosophy, you become a master in philosophy, and then you can go on to take your degree in theology, or you take your degree in law, or you go on to do medicine. And, and hence those, oh, those Latin, either your alphabet soup initials after people's names, PhD, Doctor Philosophy, Doctor of Philosophy. It doesn't matter what discipline in the humanities, even some of the sciences, you have a PhD, Philosophy Doctor, right? If uh, you're a doctor in medicine, so the Medicine Doctor, Doctor of Medicine, right? If you were a, uh, you know, a, jur a Juris Doctor, right? People say, oh, he's got his Juris Doctor, what's that? So Juris Doctor, Doctor of Law, right? And so all those titles we have, they all come from the medieval system, the medieval university. And it's funny, the, the graduation exercises of the medieval university, they don't, have, they don't happen in Europe anymore. The, the university's gotten rid of them. The, uh, you just kind of walk up, get a certificate, and leave. That's it. And so over here, on the other hand, we've preserved, that's one thing that American universities have done, they preserve all the medieval graduation exercises. That's why many universities, even secular ones, even play the organ. Because they've kept all the traditional ceremonies, which used to be somewhat paraliturgical. And the, uh, but anyway, so Borromeo sets up the seminary and, and he runs it very closely. The Jesuits are very careful about how they're, they're running things. They're training up good men now to fill these vacancies. And also invites in reformed orders, the Capuchins, okay, reformed Dominicans, others who are going to preach and regularly is making sure not just because the usual thing, people can expect a sermon in, in Sundays of Advent and Lent. No, usually about it. That was when you had sermons. So Borromeo gets sermons going. For, at first, he starts every day, and then he, then he backs off a little bit, and then lets them you know, preach as is needed. So then it becomes all Sundays and feasts or sermons. And that was a new and unheard of thing since the early Middle Ages, right? where now you've got sermons on every Sunday. You can count on them. You used to preach every Sunday. You did if you could get someone in there, but faculties to preach were very rarely given to the local clergy because usually they got a very poor education. See, if the guy ahead of you knew something, and you were apprenticed, and you learned something decent, and then you could pass it on to the next guy. If the guy ahead of you was one of those that kind of throw out a bunch of, like, uh, half-correctly said Latin words, and uh, do a couple of rituals and walk away, they're food, you're not going to learn anything. 
even if you're going to get orders, you still won't learn anything, even if you're a good man. So that becomes one of those big problems, and the seminary is meant to fix all that. Now you've got intelligent people that have the capacity to learn what needs to be learned, and now that you can fill and take over these positions and parishes, and that sort of starts to relieve the problem. The mendicants come in and preach frequently. They're the ones who used to get the faculties to preach, but the local clergy get in there too. So everything is really moving at pace in Milan. And then more a man turns his attention to all the outer groups, how the people in the country are getting served. The, are they getting served the gospel? Are the preachers coming around and uh, welcoming them with money? And so he starts sending the Jesuits to preach, and he pays them ahead of time so that all their expenses to make certain that they won't ask the people for anything. And it's actually a good, a good tactic. St. Robert Bellman did the same tactic when he was a bishop in order to make sure that the priests are not asking anything for the people so the people will trust them. Because vagrant priests for so long, the spoil of medieval jokes and everything, this is the real issue you've got to deal with, is that corruption is so deep-seated and so long remembered. Will avoid it. So Borromeo becomes this great fixture of the church. He has for his model in his own cell a portrait of St. Ambrose, his predecessor in that see, and another portrait of St. John Fisher, the holy bishop of Rochester, martyred by Henry VIII, as his models of what a bishop should be. And he exemplifies this. Most things canonized very quickly, which is rare this time. St. Robert Bellarmine is perhaps one of the most important saints of the Counter Reformation and ranks up there with Philip Neri and St. Pius V and others, and certainly uh, Borromeo and Canisius. And he's one of the saints that without him, the Counter-Reformation would be noticeably different. Now, a lot of people think that Bellarmine had something to do with the Council of Trent, that he was involved with it, as I keep getting that question all the time, but it's not true. He was born in 1542, three years before Trent started, and he was only in the Roman College in 1560, just a couple of years before it ended. So he had no interaction with Trent at all, except for the fact that his uncle, Mar uh, Marcello Trevini, future Marcellus II, was a people legate in Trent. And that's about the only connection he had. So Monte Pociano is a hill town in uh, Italy. It's fantastic and breathtaking. But if you get off the train in Monte Pociano, it's true, you got off at a stop that says Monte Pociano. But you look and you see this from a few miles out when the train goes by. So it's not uh, it's not the place to go by train. If you really want to get there easy, you want to take the road route from Siena, and then you can get into it. Um, otherwise, you're backpacking for about a day before you get up there, <laughs> roughly from the train stop, um, <clears throat> which I did not know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I went through there, but uh, fantastic hilltop places, much like cities like Assisi and that, that central belt in Umbria, where if you just took away the cars and some of the modern signs, they would be. Um, just like a medieval city would be fantastic. Um, and of course, I think electricity and the warm showers are nice, but anyway. Monte Pociano had its own culture. It was uh, typically a noble uh, culture of poor gentry. And the reason is that the city itself uh, originates from the city of Roman city of Clusium, where Lars Percent about in ancient and Livy's novels that um, he would destroy the Romans altogether. And so the, the city in the 7th century AD was destroyed by an earthquake, and so the nobility of the city moved to Montepulciano, and the peasants and the working class went to a different city. So the, everyone in Montepulciano has some claim to be some sort of nobility. Okay. So that never was, so there um, in the city was Vincenzo Bellamini, who was a very poor uh, artisan, but he, he's uh, arranged to marry Cinzia Cervini who's Pope Marcel, future Pope Marcellus II's sister. And in their marriage turns out to be very happy. They have several children, one of whom is St. Robert Bellarmine. When uh, Cervini comes to visit, he brings one of the first Jesuits with him, Pasquez Broet, who's a really interesting guy. Again, not enough time to talk about him. He gives a spiritual conference in spite of his splitting headache. It was so powerful that Robert Bellarmine's mother, uh, Cynthia, decides my children are being Jesuits. And, and she always avails herself of the Jesuits and makes make pilgrimages to Loretta because there's an order of truly reformed priests. So St. Robert gets a very brilliant classical education, first with the local tutors of the town, and then with the Jesuits. At first he thinks he wants to be a doctor. He's extremely good at Latin, and to the point where he started writing his own poetry, which, as he says in his autobiography, he never wrote anything. He didn't have Virgil's authority, right? The Roman poet Virgil. He always kept a very pure verse, very Roman, very Latin. And he used to give Latin uh, elegies and sermons and different things, even as a boy. 
right, to, to in public festivals and things. Like he, he gave an account of Cardinal de Nobody, who was a young man who was made a cardinal, but unlike uh, the case of Julius III, this man was a saint and he was fluent in Latin and Greek like Angel Levin, this person, Roberto de Nobili, and they shared the same name too. So Robert was really interested in this kid. He was made a cardinal, it was so holy that everyone you know, around him wanted to, to emulate him and change their lives, right? He died very, very young. So Bellarmine wanted to enter the Jesuits, and at first his father resisted, but eventually gave way, and so he and his uh, cousin made their way to Rome, where they entered the Jesuits at the Roman College. Now this was the, the, child, the brainchild of Ignatius of Loyola. He scrimped, and he saved, and he plotted, and he planned, and just barely managed to get the right from Pope Paul IV. He hated him, and probably would have rather seen him in a heresy trial than in a uh, running in order. Uh, nevertheless, gave the, the authority to issue their own degrees. So they, the Roman College could be a real university, just like that of uh, uh, Paris and other places. And so the Jesuits used their Parisian methods of teaching, which were just simply excellent. And the Jesuits charged no fees. So not even once from the time of Romulus and Remus to, to this very time did Rome ever have an institution that could that offered you know all, all the humanities, Greek and even Hebrew at no cost. And so naturally, what happens then is the place gets crowded up and full of people, and they, they have no room for anybody, and they, they're always begging for money again because they need, you know they don't charge any fees, right? So they need you know, the upkeep from patrons and whatnot. So Pope Gregory the Thirteenth rules after Saint Pius V. He comes to the rescue and uh, builds up the Roman College that you can see there today in Rome. It's right by, the, right around the, uh, the corner from this church, by the way. Uh, the right answer from this university is um, not that it's in the building that you go to the right. It's the Church of San Ignacio, right, which was named after Saint Ignatius of Loyola. And there is where Saint Aloysius Gonzaga and Saint Robert Bellarmine are both buried. You can see that. Even today, the street is exactly the same, so now that this part is a little closer. But otherwise, pretty much that area hasn't changed much. Um, so at the Roman College, Bellarmine starts his course in philosophy, which is mostly Aristotle. And he's always six. So he's, he's short. He's, even for Italian standards, he's short. And you can see that when you see his body, or well, which is actually is an effigy of his body. He's not incorrupt. But he, um, he always sick, always had headaches. And when he's at the Roman College, he has to deal with reading Aristotle and really miserable Latin translations. But he perseveres and he ends up learning his Aristotle extremely well and it becomes, even though he was much more interested in theology, this becomes the kind of the source, the bedrock of his, his intellectual thought, what helps him you know, do so well as a theologian. So then they send the Jesuits, realize his talents as a preacher, and maybe getting him out of Rome will help his, uh, his health a little bit. So he goes to Tuscany and his health improves and they have, start having him preach even though he's not in orders yet. And that was a, kind of one of those things you could still get away with in those days before Trent would be fully initiated everywhere. So they had to have him preach, and another priest would be ready to hear confessions that would result from his preaching. And so they had him sent to run schools all throughout Italy until then he sent to Louvain. And that's where he began structuring the Jesuit program in theology. Now, always St. Robert had been a very devout soul, and he always prayed, so when he was a boy, he always prayed for the law of the Blessed Virgin. And so now, as an, as, as an adult, and now ordained finally in Louvain as a young priest, he's very, very devout all the time, exactly fulfilling all of his prayers, but from the heart. He spends a lot of time in contemplation, somehow, and yet manages to pull off these scholarly pursuits, like running a whole theological program at a big university like Louvain, and as well as uh, one, at one time he taught himself Greek because he was assigned to teach demosthenics, the ancient Greek word, and he had to write back, well, I can't teach demosthenics, I, mean, I don't know Greek, I only know the alphabet. And they said, oh, you'll manage it. <laughs> so he starts the class, and he says, now, before we get started, we're going to review some of the elementary principles from last year. So let's start with first clenching. Let's start with you know, this one. So he goes through all these things, make sure everyone knows what they're doing. And they, but he's just learned that part the night before. <laughs> and then he continues, but somehow, with all his, his duties and everything, he managed to squeeze out the time, and he had a photographic memory, and this is his advantage, where he could take in you know, so much material and then he would memorize it completely. So then within about three weeks, he had learned ahead of the kids enough of that he was actually fluent in the Greek. And that is someone who's a master of several years in the language and then went out to teach them the with no problem, as well as the, even the Iliad and other things. So he really had it, had it done. He did the same thing with Hebrew while he was in the vein. So this put him in a position 
to be an effect, a very effective writer. So after seven years in Louvain, they call for the Jesuits to decide to send him back in Rome since health is failing in the northern climate. So he gets him to Rome, and the first thing they set him doing is teaching the chair of controversial theology, which today we call apologetics. The controversial theology is the, at that in those days, it was a very new discipline, and it was also a bit of a snake pit. You would look for any argument you could make to make your opponent look bad. And Catholic and Protestant together are both guilty of using abusive language whenever we could. Remember last night we mentioned with Thomas More, he shows himself just as, as adept as Luther is using four-letter words in Latin, which have a few more letters, and <laughs> the uh, you know it bad all kinds of rude and bad language. Well, this, you wouldn't believe it unless you'd spent the time I've spent looking through a lot of this literature. Even great Jesuits like Stapleton and others are not above using rude language to describe their opponents. A lot of times, too, so it's not just on the Protestant side. And a lot of times, then, they'll, they'll start making classical reverence, references in a rather abusive way, like, I'll clean out the Augean stables of your uh, discussion. If that falls on uh, deaf ears for moderns, it's because the mythology of the Augean stables was one of the labors given to Hercules, and it was so filthy from so many animals uh, leaving excrement there for thousands of years that it was thought that it was impossible to possibly clean this out. Hercules then has to has to clean it out. It's only because he's semi-divine that he can do it in the myth, right? So then the reference goes, "I'm going to clean the Augean stables of your argument," as it is all a bunch of, you know what? <laughs> so that's uh, so you see those sorts of things. So Bellarmine keeps himself aloof from that world altogether. And he's mostly interested in the argumentation. So one of the things he did when he was in Louvain is he had spent the time, this is where he first encounters Protestants. And he takes the time to investigate what all their teachings are. And he's able to read their books. And because he has this photographic memory, he's able to remember all their propositions, what they actually taught in context. So this was a problem because even very good theologians like Melchior Kahneman and others, that it was a Dominican, when they looked at it, they only see one or two things at a time. Because again, you have censorship. And you can't get a Protestant work into Spain or into Italy. So it's uh, you're getting by report or you're getting special permission to spend all kinds of money to finally get a hold of one of their books and only be one or two. So in Louvain, Bellarmine has access to almost all of them and reads them and learns all of their propositions. But at the same time, he'd managed to memorize the vast corpus of the Church of Fathers. Now in those times, you might be an expert in St. Augustine. You might have read like everything St. Augustine had written and he would know General Tertullian and Cyprian and some other Latin fathers. Or, but conversely, you would know the Greeks, typically Basil, St. Basil the Great, or St. Gregory, Byzantium, or you know, a handful of others, Theodore and you know one really, really well, and the others kind of generally. Bellarmine knew them all really, really well. Because of this photographic memory, he was able to remember all of their propositions, all of the things that, that they kind of related on, on all the questions of the church, the sacraments, the, even the papacy. So when he gets in to teach this class, he's being able to leave various headings on the board. Pope, scripture, tradition, sacraments, justification, etc. And he's able to lay out, well, this is what the Protestants taught and their books. And he's able to lay out exactly what they taught as he read them in their own works. And this is what the fathers teach. And then so his students could see it. Here's one, here's the other. Here's what the fathers taught on this and all the citations. You can go find them. And here's what the Protestants teach that's against what the Fathers taught. And so he would lay that out really clearly, and people say, well, so you teach these treatises on Scripture, on, um, on Christology, on the Pope, on the nature of the Church, on ecclesiology. He would teach on uh, the sacraments and all these different tr treatises. And so people were like, wow, this is great stuff. So the Pope hears about it, bishops are giving this kind of classes are absolutely crowded. So he's the first two people have tried this before and failed. So he's the one that makes it work because of this great knowledge of this photographic memory. So the uh, so Pope Gregory the Thirteenth furnishes money for the production of this into a book, which is a, not as straightforward as it sounds. So if you've got lecture notes and you're producing teaching in class, and now you're being told make it a book, you've got to do what you do in class, but you've got to do it in writing, which means using a certain rhetorical style that's foreign to the lecture hall. And you have to be able to you know, also make sure all your sources are correct, you have to cite them, and maybe it was in this book, and maybe it was in that book, so you have to double check. It's a massive amount of work. You have to write it in handwriting, clear up for the printers, because you've got a typewriter invented for about 400 years. So you have to clearly, carefully write out everything in a hand that somebody could read. And then you need to select a printer that's gonna do it. So they select the, the printers in Ingolstadt, 
which is where I went to this edition, that's where this very first edition in Ingolstadt. Um, and so they had to read his Latin. And that's also why you often find the Greek and the Hebrew in these original books are, are wrong. The Greek, you're more likely to have someone that knows what they're doing, at least in terms of the alphabets. The accents are usually wrong. Then the Hebrew is really a disaster because sometimes they, they can't read it right, and so they just put in whatever, where their fonts don't have that letter in it. Because <laughs> it's because for the printers, printing Hebrew is a totally new thing. For a lot of them, if they don't know it themselves, it's going to be messed up. Then they have to typeset every page, lay it out going this way, backwards, so that it will come out correctly on the other side. So then you have something that looks more like an old wine press. And so you get the uh, splotch your ankle over the, the plate, pull the crank the, the press down real hard, and you have to do it right every time, otherwise you're going to have a faded page. That's why you do see sometimes the old look a faded page, and they didn't feel like doing it again. So just <laughs> and then, uh, so anyway, so you pick this up, hang those up to hang that up to dry, and you keep going. So however many copies of this uh, run you're supposed to do, that's how many pages you're doing on every plate. Now you've got to go reset the plate again. So as much as printing is an advance over the old way of the monks sitting there copying this book out for 20 years, now it's it's six months, seven months, a year, but it's still laborious, constant work. And it's very expensive. Ink's expensive. You have to create fonts. You have to upgrade your fonts. And uh, interestingly, with the printing process, you have your capital letters on the upper case and you have your small letters on the lower case, and that's how you know where to find them. And that's once we get the terms upper and lower case for all of our letters and such. Okay. But anyway, so getting back to that, so the Controversies is published, and it's a massive undertaking, two million words. So I'm currently working on translating these, these works, and that's uh, so the fruit of that's in the back there if you want to peruse those. The, um, the Controversies all take on these theological tracks. I didn't carry the slide over from another talk. I didn't intend to go on that much length, but all the major things in dispute with the Protestants. So he starts always with scripture, then he goes to the church fathers, the Greek fathers first, then the Latin. Because oftentimes they'll use the Greek fathers or the Greek church, the schismatic Greek Orthodox church, as evidence against the Roman church. So Bellarmine needs to cut those arguments out by citing the Greek fathers first. Then he cites the Latin fathers, and then just general arguments from reason or other things, and then starts refuting the Protestant opinions on the, in the same manner of scripture, fathers, and then in the general tradition. And then if he has to, the medievals, but he knows the Protestants don't care about the medievals, or like St. Thomas Aquinas. He doesn't cite St. Thomas that often, except usually on points between Catholics. He'll cite, and his teaching is very clearly to mystic, but he's not citing St. Thomas because he knows the Protestants don't give one whit about St. Thomas's authority. So why bother? So he's more worried about the fathers. So they're a huge success all over Europe. The first run is bought out, the majority of those buying it are Protestants. They want to see what the latest arguments are from Rome. In uh, England, it was the death penalty to have this book, just as under Henry VIII, it was the death penalty to have the Tyndale Bible. Under Elizabeth, you have Bellarmine, it's the death penalty. And yet, Bellarmine was one of some of those popular sales, mostly the Church of England clergymen who wanted to get it, but also Catholics of England too, to bolster themselves up on arguments to use against the, the Protestants. And so, let's see. Um, actually, I didn't want to get there yet. The, con the other thing about the controversies is that the conversions it brought were, were tremendous, and to the point where you have uh, Anthony Carrier, who was a royal chaplain to King James I in uh, 1610. <clears throat> and so he reads the controversies, and he's going through it. James was allowing Bellarmine to come in, his works to come in, so that way the English divines could write responses to them. And as long as they were just in Latin, they, they could read them there. And so, like, Whitaker is famous for writing a lot of responses to Bellarmine. So, um, so Carrier's reading is all, all over this. And he's got basically anything you ever want as a, as, a, as a Church of England minister. You've got royal favor. You've got a job for life. As long as you don't offend the king, which is easy to do because his tastes are pretty much like, he's, like yours. And so, yeah, just, just tell him what he wants to hear, and we're good. And he's reading this, and he's like, wow. And he's converted. He believes the Catholic faith is true. So he says, oh, I'm going to go to, to Lutheran areas of Germany. And they're like, okay. So he goes, and then just, just to you know, take the waters at Spa. That's what I'm going to do. So he gets over there, and then uh, immediately goes to Spire, converts to the Catholic Church, and writes Bellarmine a letter thanking him, and <laughs> then uh, expressing it, that uh, all the reasons why he had to come to the church. So James tried to recall him in vain. Uh, he was not going to come back. 
So the Bellman was known most for that work on the controversies. So then uh, throughout his life, you know, he would be a correspondent, a scholar, continue working until the fateful day when Clement VIII puts the hammer on him and on his scholarly activities and makes him a cardinal. It was the last thing that Bellarmine wanted. He did not want to be a cardinal. He joined the Jesuits, he tells us explicitly in his autobiography, because he wanted an order that did not have, uh, you know, that wasn't given to having your members made cardinals. And he found the Jesuits had a special vow against accepting ecclesiastical dignity, such as a cardinal. Or things of that sort. Um, anyway. So that unless they were ordered to, they were commanded to under obedience or something. So in this case, Bellarmine was commanded by the Pope under pain of excommunication to accept the dignity because Clement knew that Pope would, uh, Bellarmine would never do it otherwise. So he wanted nothing to do with the office. So he's terrified when he becomes a part. I'm going to lose my soul, he thinks, because he's, his whole life has been in poverty. And now he has to be a prince. He has to have servants. He has to have keep a princely house and attend on the Pope, which requires a certain number of servants and everything. And he's afraid he's going to lose his soul. He's going to lose the simplicity. So he writes, you know, I've only bought, you know, two carriages because that's the minimum number I need to get all my servants in to attend on the Pope. And I've only done this and I've only done this. So finally, you know, so he's satisfied that, you know, that, okay, hopefully I've done the minimum amount. And he hates that he can't teach anymore. I mean, he, got, he has no time really to do the things he wants to do which is writing, and especially, and even his prayer life is doing his utmost that that becomes first, that he's always gets said mass every day. Most cardinals did not say mass daily or even week. That he's always saying mass. He's always, um, you know, providing alms for the poor whenever he can. So his house becomes kind of the place you go when you're hard up and you need cash. And all the, all the poor know, and including the scammers, they come and ask him for anything. Um, one time, Valerman was getting into his carriage and someone came up asking him if he had any alms. And so Bellarmine reaches in and his money purse is empty, so he pulls off his cardinal's ring. And he gives it to him and says, now there's a certain pawn dealer over by the Via della Scrafa, and I want you to take it to him, and he will give you the just price, and no one else will give it. And so he takes it to him, pawns the ring. So because this would be a massive scandal in front of the Pope, Bellarmine goes back in secret, and buys back the ring once he's gotten enough money for it. And that ring, according to the canonization documents, passed between the pawnbroker and Bellarmine and the impoverished of the city many times. He was actually called the Nuovo Paparello, the new St. Francis, because of his love for the poor and his distribution of alms that was so frequent. The other thing is he was the head of the titular church, Santa Maria in Via, which is on the, off the Corso. And what Bellarmine did there is he would teach catechism there to the poorest boy, something no one in living memory had ever seen a cardinal do. He would sit down and actually teach catechism. For this purpose, he composed a catechism which again, not so much for the shameless plug as the historic value, we do have it in the back. But um, he, so these two catechisms were written in Italian, and Pope Clement VIII was so pleased with them, he ordered them to be made for the universal church, to be written into Latin so that they, they could be read everywhere. And they became pretty much the most famous catechism, except in Germany, where the Canisius Catechism was far more famous. So as the years went on, he became a bishop at one point, then Pope Paul V recalled him back to Rome, because Paul V had his needed of services as a pen. So later in life, Bellarmine was given to writing spiritual theology on this, The Art of Dying Well, which is probably one of the most fantastic books written. In fact, it was so, it was so well done, Protestants bought the book too, in order to read it and take advantage of this teaching. James I was said to be reading it very frequently, in spite of the fact that Bellarmine and James had a public controversy where they were fighting each other in, in paper. And James had such a hatred for Bellarmine that the, uh, the entire business of state ended in England for about a whole year where James could write this book in response to Bellarmine. But anyway, at the end of his life, you know, he, he's reading Bellarmine's spiritual books to try to prepare himself for death. And there's a lot of interesting stuff with that and his relationship with Bellarmine towards the end. Other Protestants, too, read this book, and, and, and many of them would actually convert Catholic, and so they get the sacrament of extreme unction because of various other things. And so it's a real meditation on our last things. Death was a big thing for Bellarmine because his uncle, Marcello Trevino, playfulness as, as, as a boy. So you read, some some people tell accounts of saints that like, they're children, they never did anything wrong, they're always so perfect. And I'm sorry, real life saint probably had no, no resemblance to that whatsoever. So it's one of the reasons Pope Urban the Age put the kibosh on trying to treat those things as, as uh, uh, as the word of God, when these types of stories of saints would come down, you may used to have a profession, you had to put 
quit at the beginning of your book, that I swear that everything I relate here is only related as much as its history, not as much as it's true or canon, etc., but only as much as it's historical. So St. Francis de Sales, who, um, his young boy, loves the you know, faith of the church, he enters seminary and now is confronted with the problem of Calvinism, and he doesn't know how to respond to it. Is this this predestination? Calvin's argument seems very persuasive and very powerful, but he can't understand a loving God that from the very soul. And so St. Francis de Sales is rightly remembered as one of um, the truly great of the Counter-Reformation saints. So he, um, he directed nuns, he wrote uh, rules for nuns, he actually wrote an order, the Salesians, right? It's founded after him, unfortunately, it doesn't bear much resemblance to him anymore. The, um, a lot of the work that he did in reforming those areas, he also became a model for others as a counter-reformation. So, um, and that's the last slide about the counter-reformation. So the last thing's kind of epilogue. When did the counter-reformation end? Well, in one sense, it really didn't end. In one sense, it can't end, actually. In as much as it is, not, I mean, the term itself, like we mentioned last night, is kind of a misnomer. Because in fact, especially the way we used to talk about it, political <coughs> I couldn't go into tonight, they're too, too fell, too good. Um, St. Peter Canisius is uh, canonized, he had been beatified in the 19th century, he's finally canonized. Um, Of churches and so many other things in the 1920s, and that's why he wrote Mortale Monuments to condemn that. So, all the same, the Counter Reformation became part of the crown jewel of that teaching that he's elevating either through canonization or to making doctors of the church. And that's why, after beatifying, canonizing St. Robert Bellarmine in 1935, he makes him a doctor of the church in the same year he's canonizing after 400 years, Moore and Fisher, which hadn't been done so as not to irritate the English during the 19th century when it first came out. So that's, uh, so in that sense, the Counter-Reformation never ends. But on the other hand, where we're at today, I think we can properly say that the Counter-Reformation as in its normal thrust has, you know, has ended. In as much as we're no longer in a Catholic or even a Christian culture. We're now in a secular culture influenced very heavily by Marxism and individualism and in all places. And so the church is more like it was in the Roman Empire. It's in a very hostile and foreign culture. Christendom, as Fulton Sheen said, is dead. So the idea of the Counter-Reformation in terms of restoring the faith of the church and the faith of Christians and reforming the life and morals of the church, um, that part always remains. But in terms of restoring the primacy of the church and the culture, it's got to be transformed into a brand new movement for Catholics today. And that's why always the saints, they look back at the fathers. The one great reform movement we didn't talk about, the Carmelites, St. Teresa of Avila. She looks back at the old, the first, uh, the monks of the first institution, the old Carmelites in the 8th century. That's where she looks for inspiration. But she doesn't create that in Spain. She looks to that to create the new. And that's where today, to be true counter-reformers today, to the reform of modern times, we have to also do the same thing, look back to the saints and move to the future. So, thank you. That's all I have So, if it hadn't been so long, it was also a thing on England, but that's like another hour and a half, so. <laughs> I don't think we got the prayer was all for it, so. Do so you want to give a closing prayer? Yeah, sure. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As well as we can be in the now, and shall we be world without end. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Does anyone have questions? Anything? <sighs>